morning. So, by popular demand, I'm going to read a little something from the book I'm working on at present, and then we'll comment on that. This book is entitled Friends Forever Sakirati in Uttam Bhakti. And uh, it consists of two cantos, so this is from the first, uh, actually the second chapter of the second canto, which is a um, Leela narrative based on the Prakat Leela as it is. Uh, described in Srimad Bhagavatam, that means the Prakat Leela, described in Srimad Bhagavatam, centered on Sakyarati, that section, um, that begins chapter 12, up to 15, 16, and uh, some parts of 18. <clears throat> The, uh, the first canto of the book then is um, describing the tattva of this, uh, this uh, particular uh, type of sacred aesthetic rapture or rasa. And uh, that covers about five, five chapters. So that's where we are anyway. Um, and this is from the beginning of the uh, first uh, chapter of the second canto, to the second chapter actually, but it's where the Leela narrative begins. I've begun the second canto with a, a philosophical uh, chapter about the nature of Leela before we enter into it. it um, a retelling of it, with you, if you will, with. Um, segues into the philosophical, theological implications. And of course the idea of our practice is to hear such things, having understood from the first canto much about the tattva, the constituents of, of Mahdi Ross, the poetic constituents, as it is expressed in poetry, that is, it's not that um, that poetry gives rise to sakya rasa, or that one has to be a poet to taste bhakti rasa. And this is one of the principal differences between bhakti rasa and the secular rasa. Uh, or aesthetic theory of India uh, in the arts, drama, music, poetry, and so forth. It's uh, perhaps not the best word to use to describe it as secular theory, because uh, India at that time was hardly secular. It would be hard to find a secularist. Um, they were a very marginalized uh, group. But there were many, of course, um, within, within the, the umbrella of Hinduism, many different uh, religious ideas. And one of the prominent ones, of course, and has been and, and it continues to be to some extent, although we're whittling away at that, the work of my guru Marsh in particular is uh, important in this regard. Therefore, his pronoun, Nirvishesh Sunyavadi Paschachyate Satarani. This is, of course, a reference to the monism of Shankar and its popularity. Um, before Prabhupada came to America, Hinduism, Indology, I should say, 
five percent at least of the uh, perspectives on Hinduism was that it culminates in Advaita Vedanta. So he did much to, to, to change that focus. So when you see other articles about Vashishta Dvaita, Dvaita Dvaita, Dvaita, Ajinti Veda, Veda and so forth, um, if you know the history, uh, you're going to appreciate how our Guru Maharaj's hand in that, um, very much uh, following uh, as he liked to uh, think of himself, it, the mission of Bhakti Vinod. Hmm? He used to say, this is the mission of Bhakti, my mission is the mission of Bhakti Vinod. So, to put it in the language of Pujapatrita Mars, the vision came in Bhakti Vinod, it was in shape. When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in Bhakti Vedanta Sami Prabhupada took it all over the world. Hmm. And um, he was very keen on having his books introduced to the academic community. And um, as much as they weren't academic in nature, and as much as in, in some respects he didn't dot all of his I's and cross all of his T's, so to speak, after all, Prabhupada's books were spoken into a dictaphone. Hmm. <coughs> in the middle of the night while his disciples slept. I remember once uh, having a room in the uh, guest house of the Krishna Balaram temple that had a window in it from which one could look out and see the uh, veranda upstairs, veranda of Prabhupada. And uh, so I had to Unfortunate state, I was to get up in the middle of the night, look out there, watch Prabhupada doing his writing, but into the dictaphone he was speaking. And then, of course, he would, what was uh, uh, dictated by him was transcribed by his disciples, and then at his request it was edited with an idea to bring it up to Western standards. In, in terms of the English, and package it uh, in terms of Western standards and, of packaging, which is probably the greatest contribution of the Western world to the rest of the world, packaging. <laughs> so, uh, and, then, and then the finished product would be handed to him in a printed volume. In other words, it's not the proper wrote it, he spoke it, then it was transcribed, then it was edited. Maybe there were some questions here and there, but for the most part, uh, he never reviewed the work after speaking it. He didn't have the time to do that, because by the time he woke up, <laughs> there was a mission all over the world that he had to deal with, and uh, so on, and he had his own life. And his, practice and so forth. Um, and he trusted his disciples. He thought, I've given them Krishna now, and it's working wonders on them. So uh, he had very much, very much trust in his, in his students. And um, that doesn't mean they didn't fail him in some regards, or uh, um, that their editing was perfect, something to consider. <laughs> perfect book may require perfect editing. <laughs> uh, but as Bhagavad Gita Thakur said, no book is perfect. I cited Bhagavatam itself the other day, speaking about itself. It's the pen of the Yas, but I believe it's the words of Nard. So the Nard Bhagavad is inside of the Sukadev Bhagavat and so forth. So even the speakers and the hearers and choirs, uh, within speakers and the choirs, such as the nature of the, of the text. So at a point, Nard appears to the Asa and tells him to write the Bhagavatam. This is the, the Nard Bhagavatam. Bhakti heard the Bhagavatam from Brahma. Brahma heard it from Krishna. Nard gave it to the Asa. The Asa took it and composed it. So he's rewriting, I guess you could say, what he heard from 
the essence of what he heard from um, Nard. And in the, the text I said it, Yat tad bisar go janatag vipalo yasmin pratislokam bhunatipi. That there's an urgency as proper. His books very much, uh, the spirit of the Bible was very much conveyed by a, a sense of urgency now. Hmm? Go back to God here. now. <laughs> now is the time. <laughs> Uh, very sent, very strong sense of immediacy. The issue is uh, at hand. Um, this is how he, you know, led his life. And, um, and he wanted to compile the whole, do the whole of the Bhagavatam. He had, when he first uh, came to America with the three, three, three volumes, I believe, the first canto. He shortly had a heart attack, and uh, whether he would be able to continue was questionable. And, that loomed over him for the entire balance of his time um, amongst us. And so he was writing with some sense of urgency and, of course, can trying to convey to us uh, his own sense of urgency to pursue uh, the, uh, the ideals of Srimad Bhagavatam. But um, the text then uh, says, Yasmin Pratislava that there may be some irregularities in the composition, in, in the grammar, uh, but we are requested to overlook such editorial discrepancies and uh, not let that uh, uh, cause us to find, uh, find fault. Um, but to identify with the essential message and, of course, uh, take it up. I mean, it's a beautiful book. It's a, it's a Ras, it's a Shastra, it's a poetic text, a Bhagavatam that speaks in all of the voices that the sacred texts of the Hindus speak in. They speak in the voice of the king. Do this. Bring that. Offer this. They speak in the voice of the friend says, let's take a walk. You want an answer? You have a question? Let's take a walk and talk about it. Tell a story. And Puranas. Veda is like a king. Puranas is like a friend. And the, the Kavya, the poet, and the, these uh, poetic texts, like a, like a lover. So all these voices, three, all three of them are found in the Bhagavatam. Another reason for us to agree with Sri Jiva Goswami as to its being the, the, the well as the Bhagavad itself says as well, the mature work of Vyas, his most mature work, final contribution. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we let us look at the perspective of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mm -hmm. when he met Ishwar Puri in Nadia and Puriji was invited to his house for lunch. And Ishvara Puriji took the opportunity to present his book. Was it Krishna? Krishna Lilamad? Krishna Lilamad. book that he was writing to the young Nimai Pandit. Nimai Pandit was, of course, Vishwambar Mishra, his formal name from the a Brahmin family and a Vaishnava family. But in his youth, of course, he was a, only a nominal Vaishnava. This is something I think that the, that the Guru Kulis can bond with him on. Guru Kulis are, I don't know how many there are in Poland, but with this brand in America, we have a fair amount of them. Students, uh, they're disciples of Prabhupada's disciples who are in the Guru Kulas, who are, they're like, a lot of them are like devotees, but they're not devotees, kind of, they're kind of like, like, they, they like bhakti, but they don't, not all of them, of course, but many of them, they don't know the tattva, the kind of thing that bhakti, you know, tattva was addressing in Bengal, so many people born as Vaishnavas, chanting, and smoking and <laughs> other things. 
not, not, not knowing the philosophy so well, or they may know a version of the philosophy that, that they received from their parents who didn't understand it that well. And, uh, and, uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons some of them are not that interested in it, because it's a very, very interesting worldview. It's very rich and deep, and, and you can enter into it and, uh, with good guidance and never come out again. Um, so they're kind of nominal Vaishnavas. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a nominal Vaishnava in the context of the legal. He was, everybody liked him except the Vaishnavas who liked him but, 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 but had to show, act as if they didn't and question their own liking of him. <laughs> I like him so much, but I shouldn't. He's not a Vaishnava. He's wasting his time in all this pedantry and scholasticism and, uh, and, and so forth. He should be a Vaishnava. If only he would be a Vaishnava. You should be a Vaishnava, and they will be thinking, if only he was a Vaishnava, then everything would be perfect. So before he became a Vaishnava, before he could manifest himself as a Vaishnava, of course he had to meet his guru, Mishpur Puri. But he was known as a Pandit at the time, so Puriji had a book he'd been writing, and he said, Pandit, young Pandit he was, young, but see the measure of his renown as a scholar, as a Pandit. His nickname was Nimai Pandit, and Ishwar Puri, who was quite a scholar himself, and I love what the, well, the boy, the boy let him read it. I mean, he finds some grammatical errors, uh, some error in the, uh, in the poetics of the book, uh, and so forth. I don't recall if by that time he had defeated Keshava Kashmiri, you know the story. Keshava Kashmiri with the deep blue jai, Pandit was going from village to village, establishing himself as the, as the greatest scholar, and Nadia was a, was a place of learning due to, the, due, to the, due to the underhandedness of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who had gone to Matila to learn the Navanyaya as a, as a resident of Navadweep, and to bring that knowledge back there and represent it but they wouldn't give him the book. The book was not allowed to leave Matila. So he memorized the book, brought it back, and wrote it again. And then his student, Raghunanda, became the greatest uh, pundit of the Navanyaya. You know the story. He had written a book with a view to become the greatest scholar. And he happened to be crossing the Ganga one day in a boat with Nimai Pandit. So he offered his book to Nimai Pandit and said, could you please read it and let me know what you think. And Mahaprabhu said, yes, I'd be happy to. And in fact, I've written a book also. Could you, could you read it, look it over and it's a short book, but let me know what you think. So they're reading one another's books as the boat flies across the Ganga in the, in the Ganga Delta there, where the Ganga meets, meets the ocean. Very beautiful setting. And as they're reading, Raghunanda begins to weep. Mahaprabhu says, why are you weeping? Mm -hmm. He says, because I wanted to be known as the greatest scholar in all of India. Mm -hmm. And I had written my book with that in mind. But when I read your book, I see that I'm a student at best. Mm -hmm. I have no chance. And Mahaprabhu said, oh, give me back that book. So he handed it back and Mahaprabhu threw it in the Ganga. <laughs> and Raghunanda became the famous. <laughs> This is what Mahaprabhu thought of knowledge unto itself. Mm -hmm. So he had a reputation. Mm -hmm. He defeated, defeated the Keshe of Kashmiri when he came. All the learned pundits, elderly as they were, all left town 
when the Digvijaya came. And they thought, this Nimai Pandit, he's a scholar, but he's only a boy, so he'll be the only Pandit left, so the, the Digvijaya will have to debate with him, and if Nimai Pandit loses, then we'll say, anyway, you only debated with a boy in our village. We just happened to be out of town on that day. And of course, if the boy defeats him, what will be the, will be the fame of Nadia then as a place of learning? And of course, the story is nicely told in Chaitanya Charitamrita and Keshav Rajmuri was defeated and astounded at the uh, knowledge of Nimai Pandit. So, Ishwar Puri offered him his book to look over and Mahaprabhu said, this book, different than Raghunandan's book, or different than the poetry of the Digvijay Pandit, which, were, which was a hundred spontaneous verses in glorification of the Ganges, that just came out like that in Sanskrit poetry. <laughs> As I learned the, the Digvijay Pandit, Keshav Kashmiri was. So that's incredible. Say something about the Ganges. There was Nimai Pandit, along with his friends on the bank of the Ganga, having their their, their class. Nimai Pandit is, as the teacher. It's a very beautiful setting, Vrindavan Das, reflecting upon, pines for the opportunity to take birth again. At that time, that he came in this life, just afterwards, he said to you, how can, we, how can I describe the setting with Nimai Pandit sitting with the students of Pankabonga and Pankabonga? It can't be compared, he can't be compared to Brigu, who is the guru of the gods, because the Brigu is, is, is biased towards the gods, and Nimai Pandit is un, unbiased. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an unbiased person. What else did he say? Um, it cannot be compared to a couple of the things <laughs> he came up with. I forget at the moment. But if there's anything, something I can, one thing I can think of to compare it to that may be apt and appropriate, that is Jamuna Puline along the bank of the Ganga and a picnic lunch after killing Agasura. Krishna sat with his friends and uh, this vision of Nimai Pandit with his friends along the bank, I think it's comparable, he said, with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's, it's good in himself. So, at any rate, Ishwar Puri offered the book and Mahaprabhu said, this is a book by a devotee. It is a book about Krishna. You're asking me to check it for any faults, but there cannot be any faults in such a book. Because the effort, the sincere effort to glorify Krishna, he thought, is faultless. There may be some technical points to that. It should be correct in terms of tattva. There should not be any conflicting with uh, aesthetic sensibilities that, for example, the rasa, the lila, is, uh, falls within the parameters of. That's why when sometimes poetry was offered to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Puri through Srubhadamadar, Srubhadamadar would check it if it was correct in tattva, if it is correct in terms of aesthetic sensibilities, rasa tattva, then it would be offered to Mahaprabhu. If not, it would be handed back with correct this, correct that, something like that. Mm -hmm. But Ishvara Puri, of course, was a, was a great uh, devotee, a very high stature. Mm -hmm. And Mahapur replied in this way. Um, and we also may think of it like this, because Allah Muhammad asked the other day, well, one thing about preaching, what if we make, you know, how qualified do we have to be? What if we make a mistake in what we're preaching? I think he said something like that. Um, you know, one time I was sitting with Prabhupada in Vrindavan. I had heard that Prabhupada was going to cook that day for himself. So then I'm going to go and I'm going to watch him cook, or help him cook. 
very extraordinary event. Typically, he wouldn't cook for himself, although he was a very good cook. And previously, I was a sannyasi that died. Previously, I had the opportunity to taste Prabhupada's cooking. When two sannyasis, Nikishodananda Maharaj and Guru Kripa Maharaj, came to America for the first time after having been in India for years, and um, they came to Los Angeles and I was there. I was well known as a brahmachari for my uh, participation in Sankirtan. And these are, they were quite a couple of characters, these two couples of mine. And, um, and they, uh, they, they brought, they brought the, 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 uh, the songs of Bhaktivinoda really to, 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 the, to the Americas. And they would sing, Udila Runa Puro Bhage, Vijamani Gaura Mone Jage, Jeev Jago Jeev Jago, Gaura Chanda Bhage. All these songs of Bhakti Vinod. So it was so moving. And so they. Uh, uh, Prabhupada came when they were there mm -hmm. during that time. And so they were bringing something very wonderful. And then Prabhupada came also with a very surcharged spiritual atmosphere. After Prabhupada would uh, greet the deities in Los Angeles, he would greet the deities. Each altar he would bow down and then, and then he would come across and turn back head towards his Vyasa and we had a huge, huge picture of Bhagavan Narahari, Nutsinga Dev, hmm. tearing apart here in the Kasi Buddha, offer his respect to that, then sit on his Vyasa song. And then he would, of course, he would, he would chant Radha Madhava and Radha Madhava Bhaktivinoda song, and then give Bhagavatam recitation. And after that, well, actually, I should say, um, after some time, uh, his his singing was preceded by an arctic. There's another story how the arctic, the Vyasa, the Guru Puja, began, and Arctic Thakur song, Sri Guru Charanapadma, which we would sing as a. When I first came, we weren't, weren't doing that. That was instituted a little later on. But at any rate, he would give the Bhagavatam class, and after the Bhagavatam class, then there would be a short kirtan. Mm -hmm. So, these two, Yashodhananda and Guru Kripa, they were quite famous for their kirtan. It was quite electrifying. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it was kind of expected that they would, they would lead the kirtan. Mm -hmm. And as they stood down the marshals there, he was also well known for his kirtan. There was a little struggle who who would read the, the kirtan. And Prabhupada stopped and said, let this boy sing. So, <laughs> Prabhupada had me sing instead. And everybody looked at me. <laughs> it was very kind of him. I had been, uh, I was thinking certain things while well, during the chanting of the Jai Radhamadam pouring my heart out to, to Prabhupada. And, um, and I used to stand next to Prabhupada's Vyasa, and so he'd play the, the cartels and read magically the way he would spring his hand like this, spring it. You know? I used to meditate on his, his hand, his gestures. I was just mystified by his movements and features, such extraordinary bodily features. I mean, it just, just not of this world. He, he really is, <laughs> he's so short and so tall. <laughs> he's shorter than me. He's about five, four or something like that, maybe five, six. And, he had such a, he felt like he felt like he was such a tall person. His eyes just looking out into 
with such a vision. Mm -hmm. And his ears and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very beautiful. Sundurva Bhagavata in Tonk, such a person, very difficult. And so, uh, and I was thinking, I, he loves this. He has such feeling for these words. Hmm? Jai Radha Madhava. So, so I want to respond when the time comes in the kirtan, just in a way, as if to say, I don't understand the implication of these words. I don't, but he loves them and knows them. So let me chant them for just for his pleasure, just to please him because they're so pleasing to him. Hmm? They're not that pleasing to me, but he's pleasing to me. Hmm? I find my Krishna in him. Hmm. So let me chant in such a way just just to please him. And while he was doing, he looked over at me like this. Felt <laughs> him, and then afterwards he said, "Let this boy sing." <laughs> And he did that for like two, three mornings in a row at this boy's name. So I was already a little well known for my son Kirtan, <laughs> but this Guru Kripa and, and Yashodananda, they were like checking me out. <laughs> so you have to know them what, what they were like. And so anyway, um, Prabhupada had cooked there in Los Angeles, apparently, I was aware of it. And they had this samosas that he cooked. So they called me in one day. <laughs> We're going to give you something. <laughs> we like you. <laughs> and so they opened their package and then they gave me a piece of samosa. Prabhupada cooked this with his own hands. We're keeping it with us. <laughs> We're going to give you some. <laughs> the taste of Prabhupada's kind of cooking. So then they said, you probably don't get any samosas around here. <laughs> And I said, well, actually I do, because I was the, I, they had a competition <laughs> in uh, New York at that time. It was orchestrated by my god with the Rameswar. When I came to New York, uh, I had been a, uh, involved for three months. I had joined a traveling St. Kirtan party in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, when Prabhupada came to Los Angeles, and they brought me down there to meet the Prabhupada. And um, he gave initiation. Um, and so uh, I had no education or I had no resume of work. I was, had no work and I dropped out of school and whatnot for several years and so forth. So I didn't really have any um, skills, so to speak. And I looked at all the devotees, I thought they're so talented. They, all of them, what will I do? What can, what can I do? So um, I had been in the San Cruz Mountains. I had been going out on, on Kirtan. And I was, I like to talk to people about the books. I had Back to Godhead, some small books. We had the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Hmm? So one of the devotees in the, in the, in, in the uh, in a group, they were brahmacharis. I was married. My wife was pregnant. We joined the traveling St. Peter to the party. <laughs> that was what going on those days. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I would go out and talk to people, and pass out the Back to God magazine, and, and get donations and so forth. And um, one of the brahmacharis said, You should sell the big books. You should sell some big books. The big book we had was the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Prabhupada used to say it's the only book I've written. The rest of them were all commentaries, although he had written some smaller books as well. So I thought, how, how, how do you distribute it? How do you sell a big book like this? It's one thing to give a magazine you ask for 50 cents or a quarter. I think it cost a quarter at the time, so a quarter. But this is a big book, a hardbound book, and so forth. And he said, you know, you just pray to Prabhupada. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a good answer. You know, that, that made sense, I thought. It made a lot of sense. <laughs> and so, that I did, I went to bed, I prayed to Prabhupada. They, they're telling me I should sell a big book, so I guess I should do that. 
I had been living in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And <laughs> regularly getting off target here with the topic, but it's interesting to you, I think. So I had been living in the Santa Cruz Mountains and, uh, with another guy and my wife. And uh, he, I had uh, uh, shaved my head and someone had given me a Krishna book somewhere on the streets. So I used to read from the Krishna book and lead Kirtan and I would preach from it. So I didn't know how to join the devotees. I, had, I got the mantra on the back of a pack of incense and it was said, chant this mantra and your life would be sublime. So I thought that sounds good. And um, so I was living there and I had shaved my head. I was supposed to shave your head, so shaved my head. And then the guy I was living with, he was a gay fellow, real tall guy, had this really long, beautiful black hair. And he used to keep an orange sheet in his closet or whatever, in his bag. And whenever the devotees were around, and he, he was taking and he'd put it on, and he'd go out and dance around with them. <laughs> <laughs> so he came inside, shaved my head, and he said, I got something for you. You need this more than me. And he gave me the orange sheet. <laughs> so I was, I was wearing the orange sheet. He eventually became a devotee also. Several, several people, friends I knew. Um, we're living in the Santa Cruz Mountains and they joined. In fact, recently I just uh, had the opportunity to reconnect with a friend of mine that I had driven for the first time in old Volvo to California. Mm -hmm. And we were living in San Francisco and then uh, we went down to Santa Cruz to get out of the city. And uh, we were living in the Santa Cruz Mountains there. And so he was there when I joined and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I recently connected with him on Facebook. And he said, he said, I think about you all the time. He said, are you still a Krishna? <laughs> he, said, you, he said, you really did it. You know, like, wow, you're Swami now. <laughs> and it was an example of how, as I was saying the other day, if you were in the alternative culture, and in the context of that, you joined like a guru in a mission, you like really went out there, you really dropped out, you really went the full, you know, distance, so to speak. The hippie seems kind of like in between, you had left, you dropped out, tuned in and turned on, as they used to say, but to what, you know, to like, we're not for what we've left, and we want some, some love and peace, or we already get that. You know, I'm not sure, it was kind of like nebulous. So anyway, to have joined an ashram, that was like, wow. So he <laughs> confirmed that to me, and he said, wow, you, had, you, were, you were really the one. Who, who would have known? He, he didn't become a devotee, apparently, but some of the others I, I knew um, also did. So. At any rate, um, uh, when they came, when the devotees came to Santa Cruz, they, they were told, when they were doing Santa Cruz, there's a Santa Kirtan in the street, there's a guy up in the mountains there, he dresses like you, and he chants like that, and he, he teaches from those books. <laughs> can't imagine what my classes were like. <laughs> so they immediately came up there and, and, and told me I was doing it all wrong. I couldn't wear that color because I was married. Or, or the way. <laughs> so I moved down to, the, to Santa Cruz, to the city, out of the mountains with them, and there we were. So I would go out every day and, and uh, share the books and talk about them. So when I came, I brought me to Los Angeles. I saw, I saw, I can't do anything else really. I have no education or background or skills. So I know how to do this. It may not be important, but I'll do it. So I used to go out. And then I, then I saw one day on the, on the bulletin board that they had put up a competition for selling the books. And I thought, well, well maybe it, it, that's cool. Maybe I entered that. So, it's, it's, so then I, anyway, I won. There's only a, a couple of the people who went out full time. Most of the devotees who were households worked in the incense business there, the spiritual sky. And there were the temple devotees, and nobody knew how to sell the books. Not, not very much. You know, it was like 
we had a warehouse full of books. And so I just had attention for talking to people about Krishna and whatever I knew. So um, I, anyway, I, I won the competition. And the competition was the winner would get uh, Radha and Krishna's Sunday feast plate. <laughs> the entire Maha plate. <laughs> so I won that plate. <laughs> And then I would eat every morsel of it, every morsel. Actually, then they, then they changed the competition that you could, you could win, uh, I think it was like Gornip Thai's lunch plate every day, and then you win the Sunday Brahman, with me and Dorka dish plate, something like that. Ramaswar was pretty creative. <laughs> And so, so, so I began to win, win every day. So I would go out, I would take the bus to Hollywood. That's where I would sell books in Hollywood. <laughs> Went out with cartels and I would do kirtan for like half an hour. And then I would walk them down the street and sell the books. And then I'd come and do kirtan again and I'd go out and book and do more kirtan like that. That was my system. And, uh, but then uh, when I started winning the lunch plate every day, I was thinking, my power to do this is coming from the prasadam. <laughs> so I, my power is coming from that. So I have to come back every day at midday to take lunch and eat. I think I was getting the Jagannath's plate or something like that before the time. So I would eat every, you know, bit. And then I would then I'd go back out locally, nearby, at some shopping center or something like that. That's my system. So I would very much cherish that plate. And then after a while, Every day, I was thinking, this came to be very natural. I was thinking, I'm eating this whole plate, but actually, prasadam is mercy. So I'm eating mercy, but I don't have any mercy because I'm not letting anybody else eat any of the plate. So I should actually be giving this plate to others. Mm -hmm. So then I used to come back and I would get the plate and I would give it to all the devotees. And then I would, so I, I'll tell you this, I never told this thing. Then, then I would wait till everybody finished their lunch. And then we used to eat like out on the lawn and around. So then I would go out and whatever prasadam had fallen anywhere, I would pick all that prasadam up. And then Chaitanya Chakramarti wasn't published or anything like that. It wasn't like I was imitating what I was about to ask. <laughs> but I just, I thought prasadam, I thought this, I had great faith in Maha Prasadam. And I was thinking it was actually inoculating me from the world to be able to go out there and deal with it and not be distracted. So we used to collect all of that and that's what I would eat and then of course there wasn't much of that so I had a plate also of rice and all of it was, was offered that day. That was my system. So they thought, you know, here's the brahmachari, you probably don't get some roses. <laughs> Well, I have a fair share. <laughs> but one is cooked by Prabhupada? Yes, yeah, I don't relish that. So, anyway, I had the opportunity to taste the show I'm cooked by Prabhupada. So, when I heard it, Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was cooking that day, but this time I was this young sannyasi, I had just taken sannyas that um, would have been um, probably the year before. So, it's probably 1976, so I, I showered. And, went down all clean and see Prabhupada and Prabhupada was taking massage. And I said, Prabhupada, I, I came because I heard that you were going to be cooking for yourself, so I wanted to come and participate in that. And he kind of chuckled at me, he laughed at me quite a bit. So I was pretty, probably pretty foolish looking to him. And um, I remember once when he came to, came to Los Angeles and I was, it was probably about the same year I had taken some yas, and uh, I took some yas in 1975, and uh, I paid my obeisance at his feet, and he looked, like, who is that? And he looked, I looked up, and I just started laughing when he said, when he said, he just laughed. That <laughs> <laughs> happened quite a bit, so. Uh, <laughs> and so, anyway, he chuckled, and he said, no, he said, uh, they're cooking, well, they're, they're a nice thing, uh, why should I cook? But I can cook. He said, I can cook for myself. Mm -hmm. I can cook with wood. He said, I mean like 
and wood stove. So he began to talk to me about how he was self-sufficient. And he could cook like in the forest without any, uh, any I was a young sannyasi, so I think he was talking about the self-sufficiency of sannyas and so forth. And so I have a godbrother named Gopavrindapal, who was also a book distributor. So he happened to be there and he heard that, that I was somehow, somebody was, maybe the person was massaging proper went out and said Tri Parmer's talking to Prabhupada and talking about, um, so, so he thought I was talking about book distribution because that was what my service was. And he was a book distributor so he thought maybe he could sneak in there and have a word or something like that. And he had this idea that it's a problem that devotees are going out and they're speaking, but they don't know philosophy that well, so they may say something wrong. Therefore, we should train them exactly what to say mm -hmm. so that they won't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. So he came and Prabhupada acknowledged him and then he said, Prabhupada, I had this thought in this situation and so forth. So the conversation turned to his idea that the devotees should, before going out, they should be trained exactly what to say and what not to say. The Prabhupada didn't like the idea. He said, he said, no. He said, preaching is spontaneous. He said, just like Tripura Marsh. <laughs> Krishna is speaking to him in his heart, and then he repeats that to the people, and he's selling the books. Sometimes Prabhupada would hear some of the things I would say. Like there were, when the first newspaper article started coming out about energy crisis, which is you know, the kind of the big early beginnings of the environmental movement, energy crisis, then that was in the paper. Probably would be up on the news and then he would take something from the news and talk about it and explain the philosophy relative to the point, trying to be contemporary in his presentation. Like you can see in his early Back to Godhead, when he was publishing the Back to Godhead by himself, writing it, editing it, proofreading it, publishing it, designing it, and so forth. So um, he, uh, um, and he didn't, anyway, he didn't, he didn't like that idea. He said, Tesham satatayutano bhajatam pritipurvakam. This is the first Bhagavad Gita verse I ever learned about the way. So, very nice to hear Prabhupada uh, chanted. And he said, he quoted this verse to say, Krishna's Tadami Buddhi, he gives him knowledge in the heart. And then he speaks that. And Prabhupada would hear, or uh, saying Prabhupada would hear some of the things I would say, like during the energy crisis. We had a book that was recently published at that time called Krishna, Reservoir of Pleasure. So I used to hand it out and say, have you heard about the energy crisis? He said, yes. I said, take this. This is the reservoir, you know, of you know, pleasure. And, you know, and I had to you know, something about it. And so energy crisis can be solved here. You know. <laughs> that was my line. <laughs> so Prabhupada heard it. Somehow he would hear you know, through the chain of whatever. And then sometimes he would repeat that. And what is he saying then, that boy? And he chuckled. And he said, Trip Barton. Yes. And he's saying, there is no energy crisis. Here. <laughs> <laughs> he liked it. those kind of things. Once, once in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Berkeley in the morning, like I wasn't there, but I heard the tape. One devotee asked, but Prabhupada had an idea that if we make Bengali sweets and sell them, they would be very popular. Then we can make money to sustain ourselves for the mission. And Prabhupada said, what is that boy's name? Hmm? Somebody knew enough to say, Tripurari. He said, yes, he is selling the Bengali sweets. Chaitanya Charitamrita. We will maintain ourselves in this way. Prabhupada said when he, when he crossed the ocean that his, his, he, was, he was living on Chaitanya Charitamrita. This book was nourishing him, keeping him alive, keeping his heart beating as he traveled into the unknown. You have to understand that getting on that boat was like 
do you want to try out, what is his name, Musk? The guy with the Tesla cars? Tesla. Alan. Hmm? Alan. Alan Musk. He wants to take, you know, sell tickets to outer space. That would look like if you were to get on one of those, here we go. Property is like on the ocean, it's like, where am I going? It's like going to outer space. When he got to New York, he wrote back about it. He said, it's different here. There's so many lights on at night that it's like daytime. <laughs> and everybody has a car. And everybody drives it. <laughs> because in India, only the rich people had cars, and they had drivers. <laughs> it was like another planet for them. <laughs> they all drive them. Lights on at night, like make it like day. <laughs> it's how it was like, they'd gone to another planet with a, with a, with a, with a trunk of books. <laughs> we tell about Goloka mm -hmm. from Bart from Brudge with Bart, just another dimension, right? Another dimension he came. So, anyway, he told that devotee, Gopa Vrindapal, nice name, Gopa Vrindapal. The Pal, or the Gopa Vrinda, the protector of the, of the group of, of uh, Govinda's Gopas. Govinda hmm? is the protector of his group of friends. Rakshikshatri Vishpashpo, as we said, and protected them as they marched in the mouth of Agasura. So, anyway, um, Prabhupada said, no, the devotees, you had to let them be individual and have, that follow their individual inspiration. He wanted to encourage that. And then Gopavrana Paul said, but Prabhupada, Tamal Krishnamar said that you gave all the devotees that they had to, you know, when they went out, they had to collect a certain amount of money, so you regulated it in that way. And Prabhupada, I have never said that. That is Tamal Krishnamar's Kajal concoction. <laughs> <laughs> Just as an aside there. So his idea was that they would go out and they would have it chanted all morning, they would be inspired. That's what I used to do with the massages. And I, after the morning program, then I would go before the deities and I would chant until I got inspired. <clears throat> until I got so absorbed that I began to move in bliss rather than by any other motive. That's then I would go out. It was my system. And so he probably kind of looked at us like that. They're going out in bliss and they're saying something. It may not be perfect. But the heart it's coming from, the intention is perfect, and they might say it a little wrong, but they're giving the perfect book. <laughs> so, no harm. It's made up for them. So this was his uh, spirit. And again, he had a sense of urgency, so he placed a lot of trust in us, let them go. And sometimes the trust was violated, and we did things that were ended up being not approved by him, but he was very, very generous with us. And he didn't stop trusting us. He didn't really have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the early beginnings of the international uh, uh, dispensation of Chaitanya, those divine precepts. And um, so, Ishwar Puri, there he was in the house of Mahaprabhu, and Mahaprabhu said, check out my book. First thing Mahaprabhu said, well, it, 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 it really, there can't be any fault in a book written by a devotee like you. And he insisted, no, keep it, and keep reading it, please find it. So later Mahaprabhu found something, what was it, an um, incorrect verb or something like that, and so he brought it up to him. He said, yeah, you want some minor thing I, I found? And then Ishwar Puri said, oh, he looked at it and he meditated on it. And he looked at it very carefully overnight. He said, actually, I was, I was right what I said here. He, he might pun it was wrong. So he went back to me, my pun, and said, I'm right, he wrong. And me, my pun, was very pleased. <laughs> by his guru. The only one who ever corrected me, my pun, did. Everybody else, no one could defeat him. It was his guru. 
very accepted defeat. So, long segue. <laughs> um, but what I was saying is that um, rasa, rati, we sometimes say, sometimes say madhuri rati, sakya rati. The word sakya rati, madhuri rati applies both to the budding stage of rati and the mature stage of rati, which is sometimes the latter, which is sometimes referred to as rasa. So sometimes the word sakya rati will be referring to the Baba stage, sometimes it may be employed to be referring to, to, to Prema. Mm. But at any rate, Rati. Mm. Prema is constituted of Rati. Rati is a, it's, it's thought to be unto itself a, a ray of the sun of Prema. Mm. And Bhakti Rasa comes from that. So Bhakti Rasa doesn't come from poetry. Secular aestheticians like Bard Muni, the original in India, and later Vishwanath and Sahitya Dharma, not Vishwanath Chakravarti, but these are as I say, secular authors. But again, it's hard to really call them secular because they had their own religious conception. Bard's idea was that through the arts, we are displaced by participating them in them from our everyday life. Mm -hmm. by way of being catapulted into the drama, into the song, into the poetry itself, and experiencing the emotions therein. And that displacement mm -hmm. is something like Shanta, something, well, it was something like Brahman. So we thought of it as a kind of a tool, something like that. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not a theory of bhakti rasa, hmm? but how the arts may be facilitate us in, in giving, up, giving us like an altered perspective and opening us to, I'm not an expert on this theory, but transcendence, like, uh, so, uh, of course, Rupa Goswami taken to terms from his, so he's not entirely secular is what I would say, but, but he, he's not writing about Bhakti Rasa. So the Rasa that he's talking about is secular poetry. And in secular poetry, the poetry itself gives rise to Rasa. Rasa is like the soul of the poetry, right? So when the Baba's that combine together the vibhav, the sattvika, the sattvai vibhav, the, the vibhav, the sattvi, uh, sanchari vibhav, and so forth. When these all combine together, hmm, they arise out of the sattvai vibhav, like, like water in the ocean arises and turns into a cloud, and then that water pours down again on the sattvai vibhav in the form of the vibhav, sattvika vibhavs, Sanchari vows, unvows, and so forth. It's in technical terms, and you may not understand them thoroughly. I've written about them and explained them at some length in the book that we're supposed to be reading from this morning. <laughs> um, but um, as a composite, then, uh, these turn Rati into Rasa. Mm -hmm. And so, Poetry does not give rise to rasa. You don't have to be a poet or a person of the arts to taste bhakti rata, ra, ra, bhakti rasa. What did Mahaprabhu say in this regard? Why use his poetry if it doesn't make the um, head mm -hmm. spin? Is it the what use his poetry if it doesn't make the head spin? Not, uh, not I think a verse of Rupa Goswami. No, that's no. not. Kavitamba. Hmm? Kavitamba. That's right. Nadanam. Nadanam. Nasundarim. Kavitamba. I'm not. It is Ruchi. Ruchi Bhakti. Shuddha Bhakti. The higher stages of, uh, of Sadhana. Hmm? Where, where 
desires, longings, real in, within sadhana is, 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 is starting to become prominent. Anyway, then it, it's defined in Shikshastaka in a negative way. Not, not this, not this, not this. I don't desire the world. The world means fame, ajanam, wealth, nadanam, nasundarim, romantic companionship, for example, sundarim, and kavita. Kavita means, kavita means poetry. So he means neither the arts. This is, this is, you know, somewhat removed, refer, refined, sattvic sensibilities. If you want to go and listen to classical music, it's not like hip hop. <laughs> what kind of adhikar do you need to like hip hop? You need a good dose of tamaguna, probably. <laughs> 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 Classical music, you know, it's like boring, weird, unless you've got right, the adhikar for that. Uh, refined, sattvic personality, somewhat removed from the, from the, from the herd, right? If, we, if humanity is moving away from animality, hmm, and this is far, far removed, sophisticated, cultured, educated, Refined, <laughs> sattvic sensibilities. Mm. And says, Kavitamba. That won't get you Bhakti Rasa. You can't just be, by becoming a poet, you can't get my Rasa. No. Mm. Not like that. But by Rati, you can get Rasa. Rasa comes from Rati. But the nature of this Rasa is such that it can take poetry and turn it into something by which you can get rati. It can spiritualize the poetry. It can take the language of poetry, which is most suitable for speaking about rasa, because it's a world of all possibilities. Poetry, we can use that kind of language. So sometimes say, the moon can have wings and fly across the sky in poetry. You have to understand, this is just a different way of looking at the world. It's as real. Niels Bohr, the famous, I think it was Niels Bohr, famous uh, Nobel laureate physicist, he said, the religious stories and myths and poetry and so forth, mm, they are not unreal or less real than our scientific pronouncements. They are ways of speaking about things that our scientific method cannot, cannot grasp. There are things beyond words, beyond observation, beyond the limits of the senses, beyond the limits of our uh, ability, intellectual ability to reason about empirical observations and reach conclusions. With that, we cannot reach a conclusion that will fully satisfy us. That means we can't reach comprehensive knowing. Comprehensive knowing is that knowing by which I know I don't need to know anything else. Hmm? A noetic bliss. Hmm? A, a, a knowing, a, a bliss that is wise. It's, it's Ladini and Samvit, a wise kind of knowing. A wise kind of loving, I should say. Wise love. And, and so, who has Rati, where do you get Rati from? Someone who has Rati. That means from Guru Parampurami. So then, then that, if we want to speak about that, our Goswamis have spoken about that. They've written about that. In, they've, when you're writing directly about it, when writing philosophically about it, and then you want to write in prose and philosophically, the Rupa Goswami's done that in Bhakti Rasipi just And of course, it's peppered with poetry, pramanas, and so forth. And, and then the Lila Granta books, which is like the second canto of this book, is like a retelling the narrative of the 
you know, the Prakat Lila of the, of the Sakyarasa center of the Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So it, when they wrote books like this, then they, uh, then they were all uh, in poetry. Mm -hmm. So they employed this language, and that language then becomes empowered mm -hmm. with Rati. Mm -hmm. Then that poetry can be an aid to our attaining and tasting Rati and Rati Rasa. Therefore, we should not. Therefore, if we, therefore, if we do want to write poetry about Krishna, it should have some tattva and proper understanding, and so that it will it, it become such that it will have power. Mm -hmm. Power. It's not just sit down and with your material emotions and sensibilities write a poem. Mm -hmm. um, you can start somewhere, but the poetry of the Goswamis, this is rich, empowered poetry. It doesn't say everything about, uh, you can't say everything about what is, what is Matsalya Rasa, what is Madhuri Rasa, what is Sakya Rasa. It defies words. You cannot put it in words, but whatever words it is put in, by some, by some experience of that, that poetry will be empowered. So and we should understand, of course, by extension, what to speak of having the ability, Rati, to transform poetry into a vehicle for its dissemination and its nourishment, to nourish one's own Rati, to express it in poetry. That poetry will then nourish the Rati. What to speak of being able to do that with poetry? Rati can do that with the whole world. The Rasa can do that with the whole world. The, we can say, these are the Udipana Vibhavs of Madhurya Rasa. These are the Udipana Vibhavs of Sakya Rasa. Hmm? So, 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 as listed by Rupa Goswami, for example. And we can explain about that, we can explore them, hmm? and so on. Krishna's flute, his ages, hmm? His age, for example, of Poganda, boyhood, is no deep enough for Sakyarasa. Mm -hmm. Actually, all the ages are, because the Sakyarasa center begins with the end of the Seish Kumar and extends into the beginning of Madhuri, which starts to begin at the end of Poganda. But anyway, the age is no deep enough. Uh, other things listed for the different rasas and so forth. But what is an udipan of that? You know, we're talking about udipan vibhav. It's, it's like a, it causes the uh, the rati to flourish. It's a causal kind of effect, right? The qualities of Krishna are udipan vibhavs. As I said the other day, certain qualities for different for certain rasas and so forth will be more prominent to serve in that capacity. But what does it mean? It means there'll be a tipping point. Hmm? So a tipping point in hearing can take a, take a devotee to tip to the other side. And from external consciousness and orientation, go to the other side, come back. Hmm? But Mahabharu was so absorbed in Krishna Rati, hmm? that the whole natural world became Udipana for him. The cloud became Udipana for him. Hmm? The sand dune, Jagannath Puri, became Govardhan Hill. Any body of water became the Jamuna. And he would jump in. Hmm? They converted the whole world into uh, that which would give rise to rasa. And this is the super extraordinary power of bhakti rasa. It's inconceivable. Hmm? How to do away with the problem of the world? Convert it. Vishvam Purnam Sukhayate. You can't do that with jnana, with yoga. <laughs> That's like, forget it. You're hiding from the world there. Look only at the tip of your nose, nowhere else. Hmm? 
once I was sitting with Prabhupada, if you don't mind, <laughs> in the eleventh floor of the building in Manhattan. This was a big victory for Prabhupada, right? Because he came and he was first in New York, he was living on the street as a homeless person. And in the end he had a he had a small but nonetheless something was scraping the sky. Right? <laughs> a skyscraper. Hmm? Eleven story building in Manhattan. So it was newly acquired and I was sitting there with Prabhupada it was recently I had taken sannyas also. And Prabhupada I was sitting alone with Prabhupada, Prabhupada turned to me and he said, Have you seen the New York women? I didn't know what he was thinking, what I was supposed to answer. Have I seen a New York woman? I guess I should say no. <laughs> you know, but I just didn't know what to say, so I just didn't say anything. <laughs> then Prabhupada said, they're so beautiful. <laughs> then he just began talking about New York women, how beautiful they were. And as he went on and on and on, he said, and then the men are so attracted to them. Hmm? And this way, he said, and that way the buildings are going up and scraping the sky. As he was saying, the skyscrapers are, are being built by the attractive women hmm? who are captivating the men, and then they're working. <laughs> I mean, because women weren't as much in the workplace at that time. And, and so, he, and, and then he said, and then he said at the end, "This is Vishnu Maya, and his eyes were so big. <laughs> Vishnu Maya, it's like so, like fascinating, it was so charming. How he was looking at the world, so." The devotee is not running away from the world. He's, he's seeing Vishwam Purnam Sukhaya, turn, turning everything into impetus for furthering one's, one's bhakti. Mm. So, <clears throat> so the, at any rate, the poetry mm, of, we don't, you know, these are abstract terms to us, vibhav, anubhav, Sattvika Bhava, you might think, well, I have to learn all this, and how do I do that, and what is it exactly? So, if you study these things carefully under good guidance, you see that they're very easily understood because they're very much pertain to the human psychology, and we're all humans. Hmm? And um, so, anyway, I've written about this to some extent to help us understand the concepts. Um, I won't go into it here, but some might, when I question at the onset, I have to learn all these terms and be a big poet and a Sanskritist to taste rasa? No, the answer is, Goswami says, no, you don't. But then again, let's say you want to watch a movie. Hmm? So every person watches a movie, may get something out of it, maybe transported, weep, laugh, become frightened in their seat, and so forth, through the movie, right? Hmm? This is what's supposed to happen to you when you read it, the, the drama of Krishna Leela. You're supposed to feel the feelings of those who are feeling them. So the idea that to write in such a way as the Goswami says to bring out the feelings. This is what the Bhagavatam does that other Puranas don't do when they just list this Leela happened, this Leela happened, this Leela happened, this Leela happened, happened, happened. Something like that. Bhagavatam is different. <laughs> it wants to tell the feeling. And it's so, Sukadeva is so absorbed in trying to share the feeling. He doesn't list all the names. Who are all the gopis? Rod is not even overtly mentioned. You think, well, her name is mentioned in the Vishnu Purana. That must be more, more important. No, you can't get the feelings of Radha Dasyam hmm? from the Vishnu Purana. From Bhagavatam, you can get that. Hmm? So, no, you don't have to be a poet, but then again, if you study dramatic arts, film, and then you went to the movie, you might see things other people don't see. You might be able, you might be able to enter into it a little bit more. So it's, uh, you shouldn't shy away from it. something that's a little bit intellectually challenging. If you don't challenge your intellect with bhakti, your mind will challenge it, your sense will challenge it to work for them, to scheme for them, for their demands. Mahaprabhu in his dispensation is making demand upon us to understand his dispensation as much as you have been like applied in this way. So, and you do that, then, then you can 
then you, then you become a real, um, a qualified person to, to speak about Krishna, to share. So, maybe I'll read from it tonight a little bit. <laughs> Something from this uh, poetic, uh, beginning of the poetic section. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm distracted. I have two questions from uh, Padmanabha Maharaj. I don't think I want to entertain separate okay. questions from the, the kind of what we've been talking about at this moment. Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, Nimai as a Pandit. Yes. Uh, if he was a great Pandit, why his Guru said to him that he should that he is poor and he, sh he should not uh, study the Vedanta, or it was just Lord Chaitanya saying this to show that in Kali Yuga there is no need for studying Vedanta and all the chanting. It was really happened that his Guru told him that he is fool. And yes, mm -hmm. told me the fool. That's what he says. Aha, po polsku. E, e, ja mam pytanie odnośnie kwestii e, Nidaja jako pandita. E, skoro był tak wielkim panditą, dlaczego e, jego guru Iśwadapuri powiedział mu, że jest głupcem i że nie powinien studiować Vedanty? Czy, tak, czy to naprawdę się wydarzyło, czy po prostu pan Czytania tylko tak mówił, żeby wskazać na to, że w Kaliuze nie ma potrzeby studiowania Vedanty, a jedynie intonować? Yes. Me, my pond was very learned. He says through the pen of Krishna Das Kavaraj Goswami that my guru considered me a fool. And I think uh, he's speaking to Prakasananda Saraswati in this section. Prakasananda Saraswati, Prakasananda Saraswati was a Vedantin of great measure. And Mahaprabhu was in the, in the process of converting him from a dry Vedantist to a Rasik uh, Bhakta, to a Rasika. Indeed, Prakasananda Saraswati misunderstood Mahaprabhu and said, he is a Babuka, a sentimentalist, a Babuka. Although he's a Bharati, he's from the Bharati community, one of our communities, Sanyas communities, the Bharat lineage, because he was initiated by the case of a Bharati in the Bharati lineage. But he's he's actually conducting himself like a Babuka, a Babuka, a, a sentimentalist. Not appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you can tell he's still attracted to him. Of course, the Bhagavatam says, Negema Kalpataro Galitam Falam, Sukumukadamata Drava Sambitam, Pipata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam. Muhura ho rasika bhuvi babuka. Says you have to be a babuka. <laughs> you understand the rasa of Sri of, of Srimad Bhagavatam. You have to be a sentimentalist. Hmm? Bengalis are well suited for that. <laughs> and the Mahaprabhu appeared amongst them. Hmm? They're like the Latins of the Hindu <laughs> sector. So, uh, so Mahaprabhu told in, in humility, which very much contrasts the pride that he saw in the Dwaitans. And he said, my guru told me I'm a fool and I shouldn't study Vedanta. Instead, he just gave me this mantra, Krishna Nam, and I'm chanting that, and this is what happens to me. I roll on the ground, I weep, I I do all these babuka type things. Like I said, if you're if you're in Baba, then you can act in any way. So he, he, he cited a verse from Bhagavatam. This mantra made him roll on the ground and not care for others what they think and weep and call <coughs> out and so forth. It's magical powers on him. So Mahabhu is contrasting the gyan with bhakti and employing the term Vedanta to the Vedantists and saying this is not the way 
who just study Vedanta, which is their way. Study the Vedanta and penetrate on the significance, the cones, cones, tattvamasi, hambramasmi, neti neti, until you get an epiphany and, and then so forth and melt the constructs of the mind and so forth. Hmm? That's where you, you eradicate karma through, through sadhana, through jnana. Um, so, this is not the way of Mahaprabhu. So in one sense he's referring to them. Hmm? My guru said, don't be a Vedantist. Hmm? Um, Mahaprabhu's punditry was before he was a Vaishnava or a Vedantist or anything. Hmm? He was a learned person. With regard to the actual spiritual path, he's saying that, that we should be a devotee, hmm? not a jnani, hmm? uh, something like that. Uh, once, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't become learned in sambandhagyana, the knowledge of bhakti. So there's knowledge, for example, of the difference between atma and brahman, or the likeness, the sameness between atma and brahman. This is the knowledge that the, the jnani, the Vedantins are preoccupied with. The oneness, the likeness between Brahman and Atma. There's so much concern with the likeness that they think there's no difference hmm, at all. Anyway, that's another point, but um, that's not the only kind of knowledge. That's real knowledge compared to just knowing things about the material world. If you don't know yourself, what do you know? You're a fool. But uh, with regard to spiritual knowledge, the knowledge of Sambandhagyan, the knowledge of Bhagwan and his Shaktis, hmm, that is superior to simply the knowledge that constitutes the likeness between Brahman and, uh, and, uh, and Atman. Hmm, right? So um, that's what he's talking about there. But I, 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 let me tell you an antidote that I uh, appreciate the point. I was once listening to uh, Bhakti uh, Sundar Govindamarsh give a lecture, and uh, he was lecturing uh, on this section of Chaitanya chart, and we were referred to it. And he said, Mahabhu said that, he, that uh, my guru told me not to study Vedanta, that hmm? I'm a fool, I should just chant. Just chant Hare Krishna. So he was going on and on about this. He wanted to study Vedanta, not about that. Just chant the holy name, this is the thing. So he's going on and on and speaking about this at some length. And I'm listening to him. And when he's saying it, he's quoting all these verses to support his point. Chaitanya Chaitanya from Chaitanya Bhagavad Gita. I thought, you know, it's got a few verses here. He's making a point, you don't have to be learned. <laughs> so they had to chuckle. So, so, yeah, so, yeah. Chanting, the holy name is the end of knowledge. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, so we do want to cultivate the Sambandhagyan, mm -hmm. knowledge of bhakti. I mean, not, who is Bhagawan? What are his different forms? So this is, you know, part of the uh, the knowledge that um, begets the bhakti is, arises in the context of. It. All right, so that's good enough, I think, for this morning. Nice to see you all. Bhakti Rasa ki jai. Sri Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Bhagavad Premanandi.